just waiting. There we go. Thank you. And you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I am probably a bit too excited uh, to be here today talking about diffusion with everybody. And I do, I do see that Chuck Schaffer snuck in here. So now I'm in, presenting in front of my uh, prior advisor. So it's uh, up the stakes for me as well. But um, thanks for the wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Reddy. I, I really enjoyed this series so much. And thanks everybody for um, coming. And it's a pleasure to virtually be here today. And um, for this seminar, I'm focusing on engineered barriers that utilize bentonite for hydraulic and chemical containment of wasted contaminants. And just a reminder, it's really important to remember and appreciate that we rely on these barriers to continue to function and effectively contain contaminants for tens to hundreds to, in some cases, thousands of years, and to protect our groundwater and the environment over those whole time periods. So these barriers are important and predicting how they'll continue to perform within a changing and dynamic environment over time introduces a lot of challenges for us as geoenvironmental engineers. And today we're specifically discussing accounting for diffusion and membrane behavior in this long-term performance. So it's um, probably obvious at this point, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. And um, I look forward to sharing some of the cool stuff we've been doing recently. Uh, as I mentioned, I've really enjoyed attending this webinar series. I think I've been here almost every single week. And Dr. Reddy always uh, shows this excellent figure he has about how geoenvironmental engineering has evolved over time and um, what that includes now beyond what we used to traditionally just associate with geoenvironmental engineering. And so to orient ourselves where we are in the realm of geoenvironmental engineering and in the wheel on this figure, we're talking about containment. And specifically, um, we're talking about um, bentonite-based engineer containment barriers. So these barriers that are very low permeability and the primary goal is to restrict movements of contaminants across the barrier. So these figures on the right, that's the black layer. And they can be horizontal or vertical. Um, the main goal is that we are creating a protective boundary between the waste, chemicals, or, or contaminated water and soil on one side and the surrounding uncontaminated environment. So I know many of you are familiar with this, just making sure we're all on the same page as we move forward in this presentation. And the way we're gonna go through this presentation is I'm gonna zoom way out for a minute. I'm gonna talk about why do we care about bentonite barriers and their ability to contain contaminants as geoenvironmental engineers, as, as citizens of this planet um, who want a sustainable future. And then we'll zoom in more to talk about what do we know about diffusion and membrane behavior in bentonite barriers currently. And then the exciting stuff, I know many of you are students, you're looking for ideas for research or, or inspiration for challenges you're running into now. We're gonna talk about challenges associated with diffusion and membrane behavior and barriers, particularly on the measurement side and recent advancements. And I'll finish off real quickly um, with future directions. So there's been a few talks now in this webinar series already that have focused on specific applications that use bentonite barriers. And why do we love bentonite? What's so special about it? Why not just any clay? Um, and we know from Dr. Benson's talk uh, last week, Dr. Yellow's talk a couple of weeks ago, that bentonite's really special, particularly because um, the dominant mineral is montmorillonite. That's really the special part of it. And it's very absorbent, high swelling clay, and it's naturally occurring, which makes it cost effective too. It's more widely available. It's mined around the world, about a quarter of it's mined uh, in the US as of last year. I love that it has the nickname clay of a thousand uses because of its high absorption and swell, it's very useful for other industrial and commercial applications besides just barriers. I'm not gonna go into the um, mineralogy and what happens at the micro and nano scale today because prior presenters have gone into that. It's, you know, there's a little summary there at the bottom of the slide. What I want you to remember for today is that the clay particles have a negative surface charge creating this negative electrical potential around the particle. And so you also have external exchangeable cations to satisfy that charge. And what those cations are gonna affect the behavior. But remember that negative charge because that's important for today. So here's our, you know, we're, we're zooming out. Why do we care? Why are we talking about this topic uh, yet again in this webinar series? And it's important to remember that we use bentonite in a really, really wide range of applications, not just landfills. So, um, Last week or two weeks ago, I don't know, I have no concept of time anymore uh, during this year, maybe three weeks ago, Dr. Yesler was here and she was talking about using geosynthetic clay liners in municipal solid waste landfills. And that's often what we think about 
for bentonite barriers. But remember, we also use them to contain hazardous and solid waste. About a couple months ago, Dr. Gupta was here and he talked about the role of geoenvironmental engineers in mining, in mine tailings, and how do we safely store those wastes. Just last week, Dr. Benson was here talking about polymer, uh, bentonite polymer composite geosynthetic clay liners for storage of coal combustion products and aggressive waste. We also not just have geosynthetic clay liners or 100% bentonite line liners, but we have um, compacted liners. We can mix bentonite with sand or mix bentonite with soil and use it for things like low level radioactive waste storage. A really hot topic um, around the world right now is what do we do with high level radioactive waste? And so we're talking about spent nuclear fuel or, or, or spent fuel has been reprocessed. And geologic disposal is the preferred option for final storage of high level nuclear waste in most countries right now. And that includes for most of these plants, having the waste in a metal canister surrounded by a highly compacted bentonite buffer within host rock. And then also um, besides just having the bentonite between the waste canister and the host rock, you also would use bentonite or sand bentonite mixtures for seals um, and excavated disposal galleries. So there's a ton of research now especially in diffusion, because these are diffusion dominated systems on purpose, these very systems for high level radioactive waste. And then um, maybe two months ago, we had Dr. Larry Hondo here, and he talked about soil uh, cement bentonite cutoff walls for vertical containment. So don't forget, we also have vertical cutoff walls that utilize uh, bentonite to create this low permeable barrier. So wide range of application, and many of the talks in this webinar series have talked about advancements in different areas of these applications. What I'm talking about today is a specific aspect of transport in bentonite barriers that applies to many of the applications that you see on the wheel here. If you think about the need for these barriers moving forward, why are we going to continue to care about their design and performance? As we look in the years to come, we know we have to be smart in how we manage increasing pollutant sources, the population, growth and climate change that are really going to challenge us civil engineers. And several of the ways described previously in generation of leachates and contaminated groundwater associated with those are projected to continue to increase annually. So you can find figures like this all over the place. I just picked one from municipal solid waste from World Bank. And this shows projected increase in municipal solid waste generation around the world, where the light pink bar is um, more recent than 2017, and it progresses to the darker pink or red bar on the right, indicating increased generation consistently up through 2050 is this uh, projection. So the numbers here are important. The idea is that unless you know, we change the waste streams or, or reuse, we're going to have continued generation of uh, potential pollutant sources. So increasing potential pollutant sources, and it doesn't even have to be waste that we are increasing the weights, rates at which we generate them. Um, for example, for spent nuclear fuel, even if we're not creating more of it each year than usual, it's still continuing to accumulate. And so we still have to figure out something to do with this waste. So more potential pollutant sources, that's going to be a driver for the importance of bentonite barriers. And now at the same time, couple that potential increase of pollutant sources with also simultaneous increases in water stress around the world. So worldwide security, water, water security concerns in the future are not just about water scarcity. It's not just about water quantity. It's also about water quality. And so population growth, industrialization, all these things are increasing demands on freshwater resources, such that by 2030, the world's projected to face a 40% global water deficit under the business as usual climate scenario. So this increasing demand is gonna be largely met by groundwater, especially in regions that frequently cope with water stress already. And groundwater is already the primary drinking water source for half the world's population. So we have this increasing potential source of pollution at the same time that protecting our water has never been more important, which means looking ahead, we know that the role of protective engineered containment barriers is going to be critically important to protecting health and water quality for the foreseeable future. So there's the big sell. That's why do we care as engineers and citizens of this planet about bentonite barriers. So now that we've, we're all convinced, right, that we're happy to be here talking about this topic, let's zoom in and let's talk about 
specifically diffusion and membrane behavior and bentonite barriers, and how that impacts our long-term performance. And what we know for sure already about diffusion and membrane behavior, and I have to put some limits on the scope of this talk today. So we are going to be focusing specifically on one-dimensional transport of aqueous miscible chemical species, um, be solutes, because we need to put some bounds on what we talk about today. So remember um, that the purpose of the engineered barrier is to act as a low permeable barrier that restricts the ability of contaminants to leave the area of contained waste or the chemical. So that's like the red layer in the top uh, in the example here. And we don't want that to enter the environment and the groundwater um, to the extent possible. And the barrier layer in this schematic, it could be a geosynthetic clay liner, it could be a compacted clay liner. We're just talking about a low permeable layer. And the design of bentonite barriers focuses on limiting leakage. And the most important property of the bentonite for this purpose is that it has low hydraulic conductivity, such that the flux of liquid um, and contaminants through the barrier due to hydraulic gradients is minimized, right? So that's, our, that's typically our goal and what we're trying to achieve and what we focus on for these barriers. And so this movement um, of solutes together with the flow of water due to the hydraulic gradient is carrying a contaminant along with the water flow is what we call advection. And anybody who's familiar with contaminant transport or taking a class, maybe you are right now, you know this. Um, and that's why we set uh, typically max acceptable limits for hydraulic conductivity and hydraulic gradient in our regulatory criteria. And that's what we focus on practice and research, right? Identifying and using betonite with the lowest or the best hydraulic conductivity for different chemical and waste containment scenarios. So what you see here, um, K is our hydraulic conductivity and the advective flux of contaminants through the barrier would be a function of the hydraulic conductivity K and the hydraulic gradient. So the difference in uh, the head delta H over the length of the barrier, the thickness of the barrier times the concentration of the solution. So the big picture, if we remember here, is that we're trying to predict and limit the total flux of contaminants getting through the barrier over time. So if we consider only the water flowing through the barrier due to a hydraulic gradient and the contaminants moving with that flow, we're missing other important parts of the picture. The hydraulic conductivity of these bentonite barriers is so low that you often have more contaminant transport through the barrier occurring due to diffusion than infection. And we, you know, we talk about diffusion, it's conceptualized macroscopically as transport of solutes driven by a gradient and chemical potential across the barrier. So if you have a concentration gradient between the contained waste side and the uncontaminated side, contaminants are gonna move through that barrier due to diffusion. And liquid phase diffusion has been shown to be a significant contaminant transport process through low permeable barriers. And here we have now our coefficient of interest is the effective diffusion coefficient, D star. And we can define a diffusive flux of contaminants through the barrier uh, in somewhat similar form to the effective flux where you have N is porosity, and then you have times your coefficient uh, for diffusion times a concentration gradient. So um, I just said that you know, diffusion is important and I'm gonna go ahead and pull an example from a great review paper from Chuck Shackelford, who's here uh, to exemplify the point of why it's important not to neglect diffusion. So we can take this simple example modified from um, the 2013 World Lecture paper from Dr. Shackelford, and we can consider the scenario of having a ponded source of uh, liquid chemical at the top. So that's the pink pond in the schematic in the cross section. And um, we'll say it's a non-reactive chemical at constant concentration C0. And there's a clay layer underneath the pond. It's either engineered or natural. We're just gonna say it's initially uncontaminated and it's a low permeable layer. It has a hydraulic conductivity K of 10 to the minus nine meters per second, which is a typical upper bound of hydraulic conductivity for barriers. And what you see here is, you know, at initial time, we don't have any of the contaminant that's moved down through the profile. And so now let's consider five years later, if we consider just advection, uh, what would the concentration profile look like of the contaminant moving down into the subsurface? based just on this advective transport. And it would look something like this. Now you know this looks like plug flow. We are neglecting mechanical dispersion because in these systems where the flow rates are so low, it's typically insignificant. 
So you would say, okay, well, based on um, you know, the hydraulic conductivity and the hydraulic gradient, what I expect for invection of the contaminants is that they're going to extend about half a meter down into the subsurface. Now let's keep the same exact time. We're still at five years since this pond was constructed. Same scenario, same hydraulic conductivity. All we're going to do now is also consider diffusion in our prediction of the transport of the contaminant uh, to be more representative of real conditions. Then what would the concentration profile look like? And it would look something like this. So you can see in this example, even at a K as high as 10 to the minus nine meters per second or minus seven centimeters per second, the diffusion is really significant. And you have a depth of penetration of the contaminant that's much deeper, and you would have a higher flux of contaminant potentially reaching the groundwater. So diffusive dominated transport is going to result in breakthrough of contaminants earlier than would be predicted solely on the basis of, of hydraulic conductivity of the barrier. And that means that if we try to predict the extent of contaminant migration based only on infection at low hydraulic conductivity, not only is that incorrect about what's happening in real life, but it's unconservative. You are under predicting the transport of contaminants. Um, and we know that diffusion becomes more significant with decreasing barrier thickness and over time. So um, hopefully at this point, I don't need to convince you anymore that achieving low hydraulic conductivity of the barrier is necessary. First and foremost, yes, it must have a low hydraulic conductivity, but that alone is not sufficient. Beyond that, you also need to consider diffusion because hydraulic conductivity, a low hydraulic conductivity alone is not sufficient for containment. Um, but we don't consider diffusion nearly as much, and we're going to talk a little bit about why. So one more thing, notice that this topic is diffusion and membrane behavior, because diffusion is directly affected by membrane behavior of the bentonite. And so let's talk about bentonite and that negative charge that they have, and that negative charge resulting in electrostatic interaction with their environment, and some actually um, good properties that allow for enhanced containment. So semi-permeable membrane behavior refers to the ability of the clay to selectively restrict the passage of aqueous phase chemical species or solutes. I'm just going to keep it simple. So it doesn't let solutes through, um, but it at the same time doesn't impede the migration of the water. So we have this net negative charge of the clay. And so around that, there's these zones of negative potential that you can see in the bottom left picture. And I, I totally stole this from Chuck Schaffel for his um, cross a lecture tour and modified it. Um, so it, we have these negative potentials associated with the surface of the clay. And the space between where we have that negative potential, what's marked as the effective diameter of the pore in red, that's the space where anions could pass through chloride, for example, because there's no um, negative electric potential in that zone. But if that effective diameter of a pore space is small enough, meaning if the zones of the negative potential for adjacent particles are close enough or even overlap, such that the effective pore diameter space where it could, the anion could travel is smaller than the hydrated anion diameter, now that anion can't get through that pore space. It's being electrostatically repelled. There's repulsion of the anion occurring. Um, and that's why this is membrane behavior is also called anion exclusion. And think about when you try to take uh, like poles of two magnets towards each other and they repel each other, right? Um, and so this is a really cool property of clay if you think about it, how it interacts with its environment. Now, when the anions can't get through the pores in the clay, well, that also means the cations usually can't either because of electron neutrality required. So this is what membrane behavior is, and it is going to obviously affect the ability of solids to pass through the barrier. And we quantify membrane behavior based on a membrane efficiency coefficient, or omega. And omega ranges between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%, where 0 means it has no membrane behavior, none of this um, electrostatic repulsion or filtering happening, and 1, or 100%, would be a perfect membrane. It would let water through, but it would restrict all of the ions, for example, chloride, from passing through. So this is actually a good thing. So how do we include membrane behavior effects into what's happening in our barrier? So now you can see we're moving um, over to the right. Now, first we're talking about if we consider just infection, then we had infection and diffusion. Now, what if you also consider membrane behavior? And what you see is that infection arrow got smaller because um, membrane behavior results in filtration 
of the water moving through the pore space. It's actually filtering out some of those contaminants and it's reducing the effective transport. Also, because of the anion exclusion, it's going to reduce the rate at which the contaminants diffuse the barrier. So diffusion is also reduced, typically if the bentonite exhibits membrane behavior. And you can even have what that green arrow is, osmotic counterflow. You can actually have water flow from the low concentration side to the high concentration side. However, I'm not going to focus on this aspect as much in this presentation because it's usually a very, very small flow and we tend to um, neglect it. But the impact of memory behavior on the reduced diffusion can be huge for the um, performance of the barrier. And so how do we quantify these things? How do we figure out how to come up with a holistic prediction of what's happening for transport through the barrier? Well, for advection, we need to know hydroconductivity. For diffusion, we need to know that effective diffusion coefficient. And for membrane behavior and how that affects everything, we need to know membrane efficiency. And if we have those three properties, well, then maybe we can start to do some more accurate predictions. And there are um, various models available that co combine these aspects to predict total mass flux of contaminants through the barrier. And um, the equation I'm going to show here is familiar to some of the people who are present here today. Um, this one's a popular expression for determining coupled liquid flux and total site flux through clay barriers. And um, it's based on a phenomenological approach. It's, it's using macro scale observations for experimental data, our K, our D star, and our omega, that we want to be able to measure experimentally. And we, there's been various versions of this over the last 30 years or so. Um, and we've used this expression to predict transport across compacted clay liners, geosynthetic clay liners, and vertical cutoff walls. And you can see there's three contributions to the flux here uh, for the contaminant flux moving across the barrier. So the first term is that inductive flux, but we've modified it now to account for that filtration due to membrane behavior. So you can see our original inductive flux term, now we have a one minus membrane efficiency, one minus omega term in front of that because the inductive flux is being reduced if the bentonite has membrane behavior. If we jump to the last term in this expression, the purple, you can see our diffusive flux. It looks similar as to what we had before, but if you drop down to the note below that, the effective diffusion coefficient inherent in that is a reduction in the effective diffusion coefficient due to the membrane behavior. We have one minus the membrane efficiency times D naught, which is the aqueous phase diffusion coefficient or the, or the free bulk solution diffusion coefficient and tau m is the matrix virtuosity factor. So there's a reduction in the diffusion coefficient due to membrane behavior as well. And that middle term is a chemical osmotic counterflux. So, hey, this equation doesn't look too bad to use. Um, if we just measure hydraulic conductivity and membrane efficiency and diffusion coefficients, or we have good values to estimate for them, we just plug them in and we have a more holistic prediction of contaminant transport across the barrier. But there's the catch, right? There's the catch. If we have values of those parameters to use that we are confident in, and that's what we're going to talk about more today. It's the um, difficulty in having confidence and enough data available for membrane efficiencies and diffusion coefficients, especially, to be able to really run with some of the expressions like we see here and improve our predictions of contaminant transport across barriers. So that's the crash course in what we know about uh, diffusion and membrane behavior and bentonite based barriers. So as a summary, uh, before we move on to challenges, diffusion is important in bentonite based barriers. Right? I've got 149 people here that are hearing me say this, right? Diffusion is important. And under typical conditions for a barrier, diffusion can often be dominant. If you're at a hydraulic conductivity of 10 to the minus 10 meters per second or less, Diffusion is a dominant transport mechanism. If you're in that range between minus 10 and minus 9 meters per second, kind of getting near that upper bound of hydraulic connectivity, you would have a lot of barriers. Both diffusion and advection are important. If you're at a hydraulic connectivity greater than 10 to the minus 9, advection is dominant. You got bigger fish to fry, probably, because you have to get that hydraulic connectivity down as your number one priority. And that might be a case where we're talking about polymer enhanced bent nights, like in our talk last week. We do know for a fact that ignoring diffusion for most for these cases, when you're at less than 10 to the minus 9 meters per second, it's going to result in unconservative predictions, under prediction of contaminant transport through these barriers that we're relying on to protect the environment and groundwater for very, very long time periods. 
The other thing we know for sure is that bentonite base barriers exhibit membrane behavior. This has been widely shown and all of the impacts of membrane behavior are good. They enhance containment. It reduces advective flux. It reduces diffusion. And you can't even have, although it's small, chemical osmotic counterflow. And if we want to confidently predict transport across the barrier, considering all of these aspects, we need hydraulic conductivity, effective diffusion coefficient, and a membrane efficiency for the type of expression that I showed. There are other expressions, even um, some of them developed by people who are here on the call today, that start from a more fundamental level of the properties of the clay and work their way up to predicting the transport. I'm focusing today on methods that would use these three measured values. All right, so now challenges, recent advancements. Um, I know most of the people, or many of the people on this call are graduate students looking for inspiration, looking for ideas, maybe uh, looking for solutions to their problems in the lab. So let's talk about challenges and advancements in this area. I'm gonna lump this into three categories, measurement and data and challenges associated there, trying to account for variable conditions and how to enhance bentonites come into play for all this, which is a, a very nice follow-up to Dr. Benson's talk last week on polymer enhanced bentonite. And I do wanna tell you, I am an experimentalist. So I am coming at these challenges and advancements in the lens, from the lens of somebody rooted in experimental research. Um, and there are excellent, researchers working more on the theoretical and modeling side, and I'm not really talking about those advancements today, but I encourage you to, to seek them out. Oh, ah, I gave it away. So uh, what's holding us back, right? We know what we need to do for this more holistic assessment of prediction of barrier performance. Um, we measure hydraulic conductivity a lot. We sometimes measure diffusion coefficient. We have very, very, very limited data for membrane behavior, even though we know it's important. And um, a big reason for that is because, man, some of this testing is difficult or time consuming. And because of that, we have really limited data to work with. It's, it's very prohibitive, prohibitive for some people to do these tests. And to um, elucidate that on that further, you know, here's an example of typical equipment that we would use to concurrently measure diffusion and membrane behavior. And we like that because then we can get both those measurements at once and they're intertwined. You can't, can't really uh, decouple those. But the issues with this equipment that we often use, and there are other types of equipment that people around the world use, is the measurements are challenging, meaning they're complex. Um, there's lots of little things that can go wrong. The equipment is usually custom. You can't just purchase this, buy it off the shelf. The procedures are custom too. We don't really have standardized procedures for a lot of these tests, which make it difficult to compare data across different research groups, and they're very long duration tests. So in this example um, shown here, there is, so this is for simultaneous measurement of diffusion and membrane behavior. This picture is actually taken at Colorado State University. And the blue pump on the bottom left is a flow pump that connects to a hydraulic control system, um, which connects to the cell, which is in the middle. And there's a zoom out of the cell on the right that shows we might have a geosynthetic clay liner or another bentonite specimen in there. We have, we use both rigid and flexible wall cells for this type of testing. There are um, reservoirs that contain salt solutions and those solutions circulate across the boundaries of the specimen to create a concentration gradient in order to measure diffusion. We also measure pressure that develops across that specimen because that's what we use to uh, quantify membrane behavior. And you have data acquisition systems, lots of pieces of uh, equipment here. But the nice thing that you get out of this type of testing is you might get a set of data that looks something like this. So we often uh, do a multi-stage test like we do in hydraulic conductivity testing as well, where you set up a sample, you use one concentration of whatever solution you're testing with, you get your values for that stage, and then you ramp it up to the next concentration level, and you get values for the next stage. And so what you see in these two plots is the x-axis, as an example, these are generic plots of what the data, final data looks like. You have increasing concentration on the x, and then on the y, we have our measured diffusion coefficient and our measured membrane efficiency. And what we often see is that as you increase the concentration, there's a suppression of the absorbed cations and double layers and the pore space, accessible pore space opens up and membrane behavior goes down or membrane efficiency goes down. And as a result, you have an increase in your diffusion coefficient. And so you get these great plots. Oh, great, I have all the diffusion coefficients, I have membrane efficiency, different concentrations for what I need to use in um, my modeling. Now, the rub here is that 
If we think about how long it takes to get these data points for a typical system, well, for one single little point on that diffusion plot, for one single diffusion coefficient measurement at one concentration for one specimen for one salt solution, it takes a while to reach steady state diffusion and get that value. So the plot in the bottom left is an example of what one stage might look like, the raw data, to get a diffusion coefficient. And on the y-axis, we're measuring the cumulative mass of the solute diffusing through the sample, and then time is on the x-axis, and we have to wait until this studies out to get uh, a linear extrapolation or a linear trend line to get our diffusion coefficient. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here is not what's all written in the details in the plot, but this particular example, maybe it's an extreme one, it's like 70 days to get one single diffusion coefficient value, one little point on that plot with the purple dots. Now, oftentimes it is faster than that. It could be as short as you know, 14 days, but we're usually around you know, 30 days for many of our tests. So if you have to do that for multiple points for one single sample, one single test, man, that's gonna take a really long time. And then for membrane efficiency, we have to wait till the pressure steadies out. So here's some data I stole from uh, Dr. Gretchen Bonhoff from University of wisconsin Platteville. And this is a multi-stage test on the y-axis. This is a pressure differential that we measure to quantify membrane behavior. And then we have time on the X. And if we zoom in, this first stage, which is one concentration, well, it took about 60 days for that pressure to steady out for us to get one single membrane efficiency point on the plot that has the green data. So even though when you see papers, you might just see these the plots on the top right of the purple dots and the green dots, keep in mind, there's a lot, a lot of time associated with getting each one of those data points. And it's very prohibitive then for many people to do this type of research because unless you really love bentonite, who wants to do their dissertation research on something that takes so long? Unless you're you know, crazy, like obviously I am and, and many other folks are. Um, but the data is so important. And I, I'm delighted um, to have uh, one of the authors here today actually of this plot that I'm showing for their, their theoretical model. But the data is so important and, and hopefully um, you know, people who work on the modeling and the theoretical advancement side would agree that you, know, you really need that experimental data to verify and calibrate theoretical and modeling advancements against. And so here's just one example uh, from Don Majani and Manasaro in 2012, and they are predicting global reflection coefficient on the Y, that's like our similar to membrane efficiency that we've been talking about with increasing concentration on the X and the solid lines of the predicted values at different porosities. And they are comparing the predicted values for the membrane efficiency with actual experimental data, which are the marker points on here. Um, now, if you look closer, there's only a few experimental data points to compare each curve with, and we don't have data points at the extents of these curves either, at the, at the really high or really low concentrations at the limit, limiting bounds of membrane efficiency. And all of the data points are from a single study from uh, Malusis and Shackelford in 2002, when, when Michael Malusis from Bucknell University was um, at Colorado State doing this, this testing for his PhD. And these are excellent researchers. This is an excellent um, model that they have. It's not like they just picked the data that fit the best. There's just not a lot of data out there to choose from. And there are lots of other people who um, do these experimental measurements. We just still don't have a lot of data. And to exemplify how much this data is heavily relied upon and used, we can look at two other um, studies uh, but over a 10 year span, right? Lou in 2007 and Revel in 2017. So the one on the left, they're predicting diffusion coefficients versus potassium chloride concentration. The one on the far right, they're predicting osmotic coefficients similar to membrane efficiency on the Y and uh, versus salinity on the X. And the predicted model values are the solid lines. They are comparing it to experimentally measured values in the literature. But wouldn't you know, those are the exact same experimentally measured values from the same exact study in 2002. So this is just exemplifying collecting this data in one single study is so heavily used uh, and relied upon for the theoretical and modeling advancements as well. So if you do this, if you're crazy enough to do this testing, <laughs> um, people will use your data. It's not going to go unused. We need this data to move forward. And if we're going to do more testing, if we're going to have more data, we need methods that are more accessible 
um, and we need them to be validated against existing methods. We need to be able to reproduce the results across labs, and we need to have diffusion and membrane behavior testing methods that work for a range of materials. If you are working in experimental research and you develop a new method, but it's only for a very specific type of material condition, that can't, is not as useful. There's not as much impact because it can't be extended um, to other materials. So one recent advancement in this area, and this is for diffusion, although we're also sort of segueing this into membrane behavior as well, is we took a uh, leaching test methods used for stabilized and solidified waste by environmental engineers and uh, environmental scientists. And we combine that with soil purification methods, uh, dialysis methods used by soil scientists to come up with this hybrid dialysis leaching test method for fast and efficient diffusion coefficient measurements of uh, clays. And actually, this sort of came up this by acting, but we've been running with it ever since. And it's so simple. It's so simple. It's you just take um, your bentonite or your bentonite mixture, you mix it with your source solution, whatever you're spiking it with, you put it into a special dialysis bag, which is commercially available. It's shown in the picture on the, the top, I'm holding it with a glove. And that bag has a particular molecular weight cutoff or pore size that retains the bentonite particles, but it lets your species of interest that you're using for diffusion uh, move through and water move through the bag. And what we do is we put the bentonite with the salt solution in that bag with clamps on either end into a bath of DI water. And we measure how the concentration of the water changes over time as the salt of interest or chloride is often what we're using diffuses or leaches out into the water. And we use that to calculate diffusion coefficients. And this costs maybe a couple hundred bucks versus several thousand dollars from the other system we were looking at. One to three days maybe to get a multiple diffusion coefficients versus much longer durations. And so we've been playing with this method and we want to check you know, all those check boxes for whether it's something to keep pursuing. And so we have validated it against traditional through diffusion tests, um, which was that blue pump system that I showed. We don't have a lot of data for the comparison between this leaching test method and the through diffusion because the through diffusion test takes so long to do. But here's one example where we've shown a comparison for polymer enhanced bentonite diffusion coefficients from the dialysis leaching test method, which is the red dots, and the through diffusion test method, which are the blue squares. And we're looking at diffusion coefficients uh, changing with concentration. And the point here is that each of the blue squares from the prior method took between 14 and 30 days to get each of those blue squares, whereas the dialysis leaching test method took between one to three days to get each one of those red circles. And that's multiple tests, so there's some scatter in there because it's several tests. And we get values in a similar range. We've also checked um, against, can this be easily reproduced by other researchers? So Villanova graduate students virtually taught undergraduate researchers at University of Wisconsin Platteville how to do this method. We each had the same type of bentonite. Each university used the same potassium chloride solutions. And here's how the data fell on top of each other. The diffusion coefficients we measured at Villanova and blue versus the diffusion coefficients that the undergraduate researchers measured at Platteville in red. And we've been able to use this method for a range of materials. So the plot on the far left that I started with was bentonite polymer composite. The plot in the middle was for sodium bentonite. The plot on the right was for um, soil, different soil bentonite backfills. So um, this is the type of thing that we're looking for when you're trying to find more accessible methods for testing. Is it uh, widely available for other people to use? Is it, is it feasible? Is it reproducible? So that's one advancement example. And the last two bullets, I'm going to go through much quicker here. Um, so the other issue that we're running into is accounting for variable conditions. A lot of our experimental work, um, all of our experimental work, a lot of it, um, and a lot of the models and on the theory side, they're for very simplified conditions, fully saturated bentonite, single salt solution, no temperature gradient. But what happens when they are, you are exposed to elevated temperatures, like in radioactive waste disposal and unsaturated conditions? What happens when the bentonite's in the field and it's exposed to conditions there? There's bentonite migration, there's wetting and drying. How do we capture those impacts on diffusion and membrane behavior? And we don't, we're just sort of edging out into the, uh, a lot of this work. So some advancements, um, this is actually from my PhD uh, work at Colorado State with Chuck Shackelford. I looked at how does, how is membrane behavior affected by the degree of saturation in the bentonite? because all of our prior lab work, our experimental work, and a lot of the models had focused on 
the relevance of membrane behavior and its impact on diffusion under fully saturated conditions. So for this example, this is the, the red circles. That's a fully saturated bentonite and membrane efficiency coefficients on the Y, increasing salt concentrations on the X. And we want high membrane efficiency. It's good. That's that the filtering or the, the restriction of contaminant ability of the bentonite. And so we have been saying, hey, membrane behavior is important based on membrane efficiency values we measure for saturated bentonite. And what we found is as the bentonite becomes less saturated, as, it, as it's in an unsaturated condition, you're actually moving up to the red, I'm uh, sorry, the, the blue series and the green and the black, membrane efficiency is getting higher and higher and higher, meaning membrane behavior becomes progressively more significant and more important for unsaturated conditions, which we're just starting to explore. We have a current National Science Foundation grant. Um, this is a student who's here actually, Saeed, looking at what happens in geosynthetic clay liners and, and other bentonite-based barriers when you heat them, what happens to the membrane behavior and the diffusion coefficient? And what we found so far, and you'll see more in the next year of Congress um, when we have our paper there, is we actually see that when we heat the bentonite, there seems to be a reduction in the membrane efficiency, even a slight increase in the diffusion coefficient. And we can't quite explain it yet because there's a lot of different competing factors going on, but there's a definite impact of temperature on the membrane efficiency. And so this is gonna be really important for uh, radioactive waste disposal, and also um, anytime you have elevated temperatures in a landfill, it's impacting the barrier. And then finally, um, on the variable conditions, I'm so excited about this study, and I and I know these um, other researchers are here, Dr. Jim Hansen and Dr. Nelson Yesler um, are here. Just two weeks ago, Dr. Yesler gave a presentation where she talked about this really unique opportunity that they had for access to a site, a subtitled B municipal solid waste landfill in San Luis Obispo, California, where a composite liner system had been installed, uh, a geo membrane on top of a GCL on top of the packet subgrade, but the cell was never filled and it was just left exposed for 12 years. Very unfavorable condition for maintaining the integrity of a GCL. And so that thing just got beaten for, for 12 years with no waste on top of it, the GCL was exposed. And then, you know, 12 years later, they went in, they were able to exhume samples and what just happened to be at a workshop with Dr. Yesler and we said, hey, do you think there's any way something under that condition could exhibit membrane behavior? Because that has been the Achilles heel in a lot of this work. All of our work on membrane behavior has been for perfect, pristine little lab samples of bentonite that hasn't left the lab. And of course, we remember me measure membrane behavior, but the question at the end is always, well, what happens when it goes out in the field? Right? Does it still exhibit membrane behavior you know, after being out there for a decade? And we've never been able to answer that because it's hard to get exhumed samples of GCLs from the field or compacted clay, and then also to do membrane behavior tests on them. But we said, sure, we'll try it, we'll test it, we'll see, It'd be very surprising if there's any membrane behavior left after 12 years of such an unfavorable condition for the GCL. We took the sample and we tested it, and we tested not only the exhumed GCL, but we also tested it um, against another sample they provided <coughs> of a virgin GCL, the same product. So same GCL product, but it never went out in the field. We measured the membrane behavior of both, and wouldn't you know it, the exhumed GCL after 12 years, it still had some measurable membrane behavior. I probably shouldn't be shocked. Um, the virgin GCL is the gray diamonds, and the exhumed GCL is the red. There's a question mark next to that first red circle because we did have some equipment problems. In fact, all of these values may be, be higher. We're rerunning some of these tests. But the point is, regardless of what the values were, we measured membrane behavior in a GCL that had been out, uncovered, exposed for uh, 12 years in the field. It was still there. So you can imagine um, then what that means for membrane behavior in a regular scenario being significant. So super excited about this. Um, we've got a conference paper and we're working some, on something else right now. Keep an eye out. And then finally, to finish, um, what about enhanced bentonites? Dr. Benson was here, he was talking about bentonite polymer composites. They offer uh, this enhanced hydraulic performance. That's great. And, and the concept that we have here, um, which I totally stole from uh, Joe Scully at CSU and Sarah Gostitis and Craig Benson's work, and I didn't mush them together in the slide. Actually, I think uh, Joe Scully's plot might be on the right and I didn't give him credit for that. The concept for the enhanced bentonites, the bentonite polymer composites, is that you are able to maintain a lower hydraulic conductivity at higher strength, more aggressive solutions. 
And for bentonite polymer composites, that primary mechanism to do that is for, through core clogging with the hydrogel. So this is great that in these aggressive solutions, these uh, composite materials can offer lower hydraulic conductivity. So now the question is, well, if we're at low hydraulic conductivity, that means diffusion is really important, right? And so what are the diffusion and membrane behavior properties of polymer enhanced bentonite? And this is something that's um, you know, just been recently worked on more because it is newer materials, but preliminary results show diffusion coefficients for bentonite polymer composites are um, at least as low, if not lower, than sodium bentonite typically. And this is just one example of data set. There is, you know, it's, we need more testing before we can definitively conclude this. But if you look at, for example, um, diffusion coefficient values, which are on the y-axis for the same concentration, 100 millimolar uh, potassium chloride solution. In this example, you can see the bentonite polymer composite did have slightly lower diffusion coefficients than the sodium bentonite. So that's good from diffusion, perspective, it should be at least as good as the sodium bentonite. What about membrane behavior? Oh, sorry. Um, let me back up. As we do this testing, we need to interpret the results that we're measuring at the macro scale uh, alongside observations at the micro and nano scale. So we've been seeing this more and more in hydraulic conductivity results for bentonite polymer composite, where we're seeing SEM images now alongside that to explain what's happening in this composite material. We need to be doing that for diffusion and membrane behavior too, if we're going to understand what's happening at that level. And um, this is an upcoming paper that this is stolen from. So for membrane behavior, this is taken from uh, Dr. Gretchen Bonhoff. She measured a bentonite polymer composite and compared the membrane efficiency for that to a regular sodium bentonite. And she actually measured higher membrane behavior for the bentonite polymer composite in this particular example. So these are all good things. Lower hydraulic conductivity, at least as low diffusion coefficient, Potentially higher membrane behavior, which is good. Uh, also, okay. so let's take a look. At, oh, don't mind. Please mute your um, mute your video. So, if we look at this example on the impact on um, the total mass flux across the barrier, we tie this all together to finish this out. This presentation for everything that we've talked about. How do we apply it to a simple example and take hydraulic conductivity, membrane behavior? and diffusion coefficients. We can use that expression that we saw before and predict what's the actual total contaminant flux across the barrier. So here's a simplified example where we have the bentonite base liner. We're gonna say it's 10 millimeters like a GCL. We have a ponded source um, of uh, liquid at the top for our uh, waste source. And we're gonna look at the flux moving through the barrier, the J value. And we're, we're putting that uh, leachate pond at about a foot because that's a typical regulatory limit. So I'm going to take data, hydraulic conductivity, diffusion coefficients, and membrane efficiency measured in the literature for four different bentonites. And I'm going to see how they compare for this simple example for their performance. So if we look at only advection, as we often do, if we only consider the hydraulic conductivity and the hydraulic gradient, this is how the four materials would compare. So the four materials along the X are two different regular sodium bentonites. And then on the right, we have two different bentonite polymer composites. And this is, these are taken from the literature. And the y-axis is the total solute mass flux of the barrier, the contaminants getting through the barrier. So the lower that value is, the better the barrier performance. And you can see the two bentonite polymer composites, the BPC1 and BPC2, they have lower adductive flux of contaminants, which is great. What if we consider everything? Uh, what if we consider diffusion and membrane behavior for these same materials? This is how that total solute mass flux of the barrier changes. So the blue is the total. This includes not just advection, but also diffusion. And then it drops it down a little bit to the impacts of membrane behavior. And the first thing that we see is like, well, wow, that's a lot more flux of contaminant through the barrier than we predicted. This is a log scale on the y-axis. And the other thing is we see is, well, some of the BPC uh, materials are better, but it's not quite as clear now, right? They're somewhat comparable to the sodium bentonite. So this emphasizes the need for a holistic assessment of all the properties, not just hydraulic conductivity of these bentonite materials. And so for future directions to finish out here, we need to move uh, from the left side of the picture to the right side of the picture. We need to consider all of the mechanisms contributing to contaminant transport across the barrier, variable conditions like thermal, hydraulic, chemical, mechanical changes, and impacts of field exposure. And we can only do that through collaborating with other people with 
a polymer scientist with experimentalists working more closely with uh, people on the, the theoretical and modeling side with this iterative feedback loop between lab work and field work and practitioners and manufacturers. It's the only way we're gonna get there because that's a very complex picture, but this is not something we just wanna do good enough at. Right? We wanna do our best because these are barriers that are protecting the environment for many, many years to come into the future. And so for the summary, um, we established you know, at the beginning with the big picture, there's gonna be continued and increasing reliance on bentonite based barriers for the future. This, this is something that's becoming more and more pressing as we move forward. And for bentonite barriers, uh, considering the transport through those diffusion and membrane behavior are really important, but data is limited. Please, we need to make leaps and bounds on testing methods that are more accessible if we're going to really move forward in having diffusion and membrane efficiency commonly considered in the design of these barriers and prediction. And we also need to consider real world conditions, variable te temperatures, unsaturated, different waste solutions, field exhumed samples, lots of opportunity there for research. And everything above is apparently likely even more important for enhanced bet nights. So wide open research area there as well. If you wanna collaborate, please reach out, let me know. Um, I obviously really like this topic. And so I do have my references, oh, sorry, acknowledgements first. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not doing this work. My students are. <laughs> um, and I stole a lot of this content from um, the group of faculty shown on the upper right. So thank you for providing much of the fodder for many of these slides. Here are the references, just so you can see them if you wanna go back in the video, I'm happy to provide any of them. And I welcome your questions. That's it. <laughs> All right. Great job, uh, Christine. Um, yeah, just uh, <laughs> why don't you just